to everybody. This is a song that you all have heard and sung a couple of times. And if you don't know it, just listen to the words. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. Silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ our King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Sing this with me. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. He's my master, my savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and Will all pass away, 
But there's something about that name. I want you to close your eyes, if you would, for a moment. I want you to try to think back, maybe to your childhood, or maybe for you it was an adulthood, but I want you to try to think about the first time somebody actually explained to you who Jesus was. And I want you to think about what it felt like when you started to understand who he was and what he had done for you. And I want you to sing it with me again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. He's my master, my savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something beautiful name, the name of Jesus. Isn't it glorious? Nathaniel is playing for a cousin's wedding tonight. So Nathaniel and Melanie are all doing the family wedding thing tonight. So keep him in your prayers. Actually, it was, I think, at five o'clock. So they should be wrapping all that up by now. But bless his heart, he's going to be tired. And I miss him, Miss Jane. Do you miss him when he's not here? I sure do. So anyway, love that fella. So uh, just wanted to let you know where he, he's at and what he's doing. He is taking care of family tonight. And I think that's very sweet that he's willing to go and do that. Um, Nothing new to announce for this evening, but I've already seen that some people have signed up for teenagers and some people have signed up for our pastor's luncheon. So please keep in mind anybody who might be interested in those, talk to them. And uh, as I said before, with the, especially with the pastor's luncheon, if somebody needs a ride, we'll be happy to go and get them. We will take care of that. That will be no problem. I'm um, just excited to be able to do some things and, and spend a little time with some uh, of our church members, especially those who are not always able to be with us. So that's kind of the goal for that. And I thank you so much for your love and your support. We had a good time this morning. We had a really good time this morning. Brother, Brother Butch, you were not the only amener today. You, you, you didn't have that section all to yourself this morning. I think you rubbed off on us. <laughs> Well, if you rub on off on us, then that's a good thing. So we love you and we thank you for your, for your faithfulness to the Lord. And so thank you for being here. I want to thank all of you for being here. And I want to say one more thing and then we're going to pray. We were discussing in choir that since COVID, it seems like nothing has really been quite the same. Diane was talking about going to a concert with some well-known gospel singers and you would think it would be a packed house, but that's not the case. Um, I know that pastors and church uh, ministers that I speak to, almost all of them are saying the same thing. We just don't have the numbers that we had before. Um, I think for some people it's just gotten so comfortable to not be. Another interesting trend in churches, especially in our area, most of them have not resumed Sunday night. Some of them are not doing Wednesday night. Some of them are not doing any of that. Um, most churches that had a choir before COVID don't have a choir anymore. They've eliminated that. A lot of churches have just gotten rid of the choir loft. They don't even try anymore. 
I just want you all to know as your pastor, as long as I got breath in my body and I'm physically able to be here, I want to keep doing Sunday night. I realize we may not have a huge number of people here, but it is a blessing to just come, especially when we can be relaxed and informal. And you know what? We've discovered over the years there are some people who can't go to church on Sunday morning, and this may be the only time they can come and worship. And I want us to continue to do that. I want you to pray for our choir and for our other things that we're trying to rebuild because I want us to, to get those things uh, not just surviving but thriving. I want us to thrive. I think that's what God intends for us. Amen. Let's pray about that. Father, we come before you and we thank you that you are so good and you are so faithful. Father, we also come to you recognizing that uh, we live in sort of uncharted waters. Uh, we, we're living through some things that are different and unusual, some things that maybe most of us have never experienced before. Father, churches have suffered, and we realize that. And Lord, we just come before you and we just submit ourselves to you, Lord. We just want to worship. We want to worship Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. We want to have the doors open and we want to have times when people can come and they can worship and they can study the Bible and they can fellowship and they can grow closer to you and grow closer to one another. We want to keep doing that, Father, and we just ask that you would bless our efforts in that, Lord. And tonight, as we talk about Christ I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and, Father, open up our minds and teach us some things that maybe we never knew about Jesus. And we want to surrender all that to you in his name and amen. This is what I'm going to let y'all stay seated. Y'all can just relax. Okay. This is one of my favorites. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus Another one of my favorites. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been thou forever wilt be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me 
summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings of mine with ten thousand be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. One of my favorite all-time hymns written by Thomas Chisholm, Great is Thy Faithfulness. That's one of those that I find myself singing when I'm all by myself or I think I'm all by myself and I have things on my mind or maybe I'm feeling a little bit down. That's one of those I find myself singing. We all have those songs that come to us. Well, that one is one of mine, and then the other one is Come Thou Fount. That is another one that pops in my head. Um, James, wave at everybody. I know they know you. I did not know you before this morning. Mr. Howard told me that he had some family coming. Well, I didn't think anybody else would know them because I've known Mr. Howard for several years, and then I, I meet this gentleman, and everybody's coming up and hugging on him and everything. I was like, oh, well, you know everybody better than I do. It's just good to have you back, brother. So what a blessing. He's got a great smile on him. He's a nice guy, a nice, beautiful family, by the way. So I've enjoyed getting to know you better. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Mr. Howard, so uh, I love that man. Um, we're looking in Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1. And if you are not familiar with it, because it sounds Old Testament, but it's not, it's New Testament. So you're probably a little more than three-fourths of the way from the front of the Bible, or maybe almost a quarter from the back of the Bible, uh, depending on how thick your concordance is. But Hebrews chapter 1, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Um, some people claim with absolute authority that Paul wrote it, but we don't know that because it's not attributed to Paul. And some people much smarter than I who do textual criticism have taken the book of Hebrews and broken it down and they can tell you that in these sections it does sort of look like 
the syntax and the things that Paul writes, and then there's some things over here that don't at all, and then there's some things that kind of sound like Luke. Some people have said maybe it was Barnabas, uh, lots of different people, but the point is we don't know. But Hebrews is a beautiful, beautiful book, and we're going to go through the book of Hebrews on Sunday nights, and we're going to start in chapter 1. Um, somebody else pointed out that Hebrews has a structure, a literary structure that is unique to the New Testament, and you're probably thinking, well, what a blessing to know that. But it is unique, and that is maybe one of the reasons that God did not allow us to know who wrote it because of the uniqueness of it. Um, but uh, I, I wrote this down because somebody smarter than me said this. It begins like an essay, it continues as a sermon, and it ends like a letter. So it's all of those things in one. And that is one of the reasons that it is quite difficult to pinpoint it down to who may have written it. But we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 1, and I titled this Christ and the Angels. Primarily, it is about Jesus Christ himself, but he does talk a lot about the angels. And so begin with me in verse 1. It says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times, and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. We'll stop right there, and let's unpack the first part of uh, verse 1 and part of verse 2. As you know, the Old Testament was written over the course of many, many years. Moses is attributed to having written the first five books of the Bible, and most people assume that he wrote this during the time of the Exodus. I mean, that's the time when he met with God on the mountain. That's the time that God actually gave him the law. And so it is logical that this would be the time frame that he actually wrote it. Some people like to say that Moses wasn't smart enough and that somebody else wrote it much later, that Moses just took notes and somebody else compiled it. But let's be real. Moses was raised in the palace of Pharaoh in Egypt, which was the only superpower on the world. And so he would have no doubt, uh, having spent his first 40 years there, have had a stellar education. He probably knew multiple languages. I don't know why people are uh, always assuming that, that people who wrote the Bible were like scruffy, dumb people walking around pulling clubs behind them and me write book. I, I don't understand that because these are some, some of the preeminent people. Moses would have probably been one of the, the brightest scholars of his day. Of course he could have written it. And he also had the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He had God telling him what to write, so don't discount that. But what the writer of Hebrews is explaining to us, if you think about uh, the Exodus somewhere around 1440-something, 1460 B.C., and then uh, so if he wrote it somewhere in that time period, and then the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, was finished and completed about 400 years before Jesus. So you've got about a thousand year span from Genesis to Malachi. So, and a lot of different authors in there. So you've got a long period of time. So the writer of Hebrews is just trying to say, remember, in the past, in the Old Testament, God spoke to our fathers through all of these prophets, starting with Moses, ending in Malachi, and everybody in between. Even David prophesied. Isaiah prophesied lots of prophecies, okay? And so then you have to consider that you have 400 years of nothing. You get silence from God for 400 years. Then Jesus shows up, and Jesus shows up, and within uh, that first century, the New Testament is completed. So the New Testament is completed relatively quickly compared to the Old Testament. We believe that the book of Revelation was put down in 95 AD. So you have a short period of time. So I want you to understand, in the Old Testament, all of these prophets, all of these witnesses, all of these people over a thousand year course of time writing down all the things that God told them to write so that people could, could understand God is speaking to us in this way through these prophets. But then when Jesus shows up and he explained in uh, John chapter 15, if you were in life group, you talked about this a little bit this morning. He explained, there's more to me than what you know, but you're going to get this when the Holy Spirit comes. That's the Gospels. 
okay? He's going to instruct you in all truth. That's the epistles, all right? And he's going to instruct you and tell you what's to come. That's the book of Revelation. So Jesus, before he left, explained it. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to tell you all the rest about me. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's going to tell you all the things you need to know about church doctrine and theology. That's all the letters of the New Testament. And he's going to give you the book of Revelation and tell you what's going to happen in the end. So Jesus pre-authenticated the New Testament. And then the New Testament was written with him in mind. Okay, so with all that said... I wrote this down because somebody else said this so much better than I could say it. Using the properties of light as an illustration, we might say that God spoke in a spectrum in the Old Testament. Jesus is a prism that collected all those bands of light and focused them into one pure beam. Dennis found that for me. Now, if I could flip it around, I would call that side the Old Testament. But if you have ever seen this before, light in a prism breaks down into all of its spectrum. But we're looking at it backwards because it's as if God spoke through all of these prophets and all of these things. But if Jesus is the actual prism, then all of those things come into clear and direct focus through Jesus Christ. All the Old Testament, people say the Old Testament, that's just history. We don't have to know that. You need to know the Old Testament. Jesus is all in it. I mean, were you, was anybody surprised to know that Enoch prophesied the second coming of Jesus Christ? I mean, Jesus is in the Old Testament. But that picture is a very uh, apt way of showing that when Jesus showed up on the earth, everything came into clear, crystal, laser-like focus. You hear politicians sometimes say, we're going we're gonna to focus on this like a laser, and then usually they make it worse. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be ugly, but when the government gets involved, it probably costs more, takes longer. It's just that way. When Jesus gets involved, it gets better. It gets crystal clear. When Jesus comes into play, all the Old Testament prophecies, they come together. Now they make sense. Now everything is clear. And then the New Testament, boy, that's good. So, he says this, in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. That's what he's telling you. He's talking to us now through Jesus. Well, what did Jesus say? Well, there is a sevenfold description of Jesus in these verses. It says in the second part of verse 2 that he has been appointed heir of all things. He is the heir of all things. What did Jesus say? Everything, all authority on heaven and earth has been granted to me. Okay? So he's, he is the heir of all of these things. It says, and through whom he made the universe. So he created everything. John tells us that all things were created by him, through him, and for him. Everything was created for Jesus. Even Satan, before he fell, was an angel. He was created for Jesus. That's kind of sad to think about, okay? But then he spent all of the uh, eternity since then trying to destroy Jesus to prevent Jesus from ever showing up, but he was made to serve Jesus Christ. We were. Everything was made for Jesus. But then he says this. Here's the third thing, that the Son is the radiance of God's glory. Ah, what does that mean? When you think about the glory of God, what do you know about the Old Testament? Could anybody just walk up into the face of God if he appeared? No, better not. What was it that they could see? They could see his glory, a glimpse of his glory, but you couldn't just look upon that purity, that pure holiness and that perfection You could just get a glimpse of the glory. But here he's saying that Jesus Christ is literally the radiance of God's glory. That's a beautiful picture. It's kind of hard to put into words. What does that exactly mean, the radiance of God's glory? But that's what Jesus brings to my heart. Oh, that's pretty interesting. What else does it say? And, And he is the exact representation of his being. Why was it? That Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember? He was asked, well, can we just see the Father? But if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
He's an exact representation. If you want to know the personality of God Almighty, look at Jesus. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you want to know the love of God, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you want to know if God is a forgiving God, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you want to know if God is a God who wants to heal people, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the story of Jesus. It's kind of interesting, uh, as I mentioned earlier in John chapter 15, when Jesus said to his disciples, there's so much more about me, you can't even grasp it. The Holy Spirit's going to tell you more. Okay, you, you can't even grasp it all right now. Ah, <sighs> that's an amazing thing. Then it goes on to say this, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Literally, Jesus Christ is the sustainer of the universe. You're like, what holds it all together? We've talked about this before. Scientists don't really know what holds it all together. Scientists can't figure out what makes up most of the universe. And I'm not anti-science. I love it, okay? Not at all anti-science. I'm, I'm only anti-people who try to tell me there's no God, okay? I'm opposed to that. So uh, I'm fascinated by the study of the universe. Like, what's it actually made of? And, and we've talked about this before. They don't really know. So they call it dark matter, but they don't really know what dark matter actually is. They can't actually see it, not sure what it is, but it has to be there because something has to literally be the fabric of the universe. I was watching a, an interesting thing, and I shared this with you before, but maybe you've forgotten it, and I can share it again, and it'll sound like it's clever and new. But this particular uh, scientist, he was a physicist, and he was an atheist, but in a 20-year period, he came to Christ. And he kept saying over and over again, science does not point away from God. He's like, this is why scientists are struggling who are not Christians because the science is actually pointing to there must be a divine creator. It can't just have happened this way. We can't just keep saying, well, this just appeared and this just happened and th that doesn't work. You, you eventually run out of those loopholes. And this guy was saying people are leaving science because it's leading to God and they don't want to deal with it anymore. And that's kind of an interesting thing. So what else does it say? After he had provided purification for sin, so he is the purifier of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So here we have a sevenfold description of Jesus Christ heir of all things, creator of all things, the radiance of the very glory of God, an exact representation of the Father. He is the sustainer of the universe. He is the purifier of sins, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. That's a lot of work. Whew. Hey, it's a good thing Jesus doesn't get tired, amen? Because he's a hardworking Savior. So I want us to consider Christ the Son. Look with me at verse 4. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. So he is explaining to you that Jesus Christ is far superior to the angels. Now, there's a couple of things we have to unpack here. Um, when, when you read this and you're like, when did God say, you are my son, today I have become your father? Well, actually that comes from one of the Psalms. And so that's one of those things that was prophetic about this. According to the scripture, and, and keep this in mind, I'm, I'm going to try to say this and make it as, as clear as, as I can. Jesus Christ, and I've shared this with you before, when, when I was a child, I thought, well, Jesus Christ left heaven, came down here, saved me of my sins, went back to heaven, and everything went back like it was before, Right? That's not actually right, because Jesus Christ came down here and took on human flesh, okay? So he's still fully God, but he's also taken on human, he's taken on a physical body like mine. 
I'm going to guess that it was a lot sturdier and stronger than mine because I don't think I could take the punishment that Jesus took and still hang on the cross for that many hours. I don't think I could have. He had to have been a very robust man, okay? A very strong man. Not only strong of will, but physically a strong man. But the literal fact that God Almighty was willing to condescend, and I mean that in a good way, humble himself to actually take on human flesh. Um, how many of you have a pet, a dog or a cat, and you love it? Would you be willing for your dog or your cat's sake to become a dog? Why not? You wouldn't be willing to, to take on a, 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 a let's say, a, what, what kind of dog would you be, Miss Jackie? Have a grand dog. You have a grand dog. <laughs> but I'm just going to say, you would be some kind of a really sweet little doggy if you were a dog. But I, I'm, I'm being silly here, but I'm saying try to imagine if you can. God Almighty, who's all of those things we just said, is willing to change himself permanently for you and me to take on this. We look at ourselves and we think we're the pinnacle of God's creation, and we are, okay? But compared to God, we're like a, a, a little schnauzer dog or something. Like, I would not want to be trapped in that forever. Am I making sense or am I just sounding really goofy? I'm sometimes goofy and it's okay. But if it gets the point across, this is why the scripture often talks about this transition. When God is saying, you have become my son, he is saying, you have become something different now. You have left heaven and you have left the glory of heaven continually fully God, but you've taken on human flesh and have become a child. Stop and think about that. And when he went back to heaven, he took his human body with him. Kind of interesting. So when you read all these things and you read, you know, what does it mean that he has inherited this or he's been given a new name, he's been given, it's because he allowed himself, he willingly changed himself permanently forever for you and me. Now that's going to get my attention, okay? I'm going to want to know something. I got one other thing I got to hit really quickly. This morning, we did not really have time to cover this, but if you would... Hold your place there in Hebrews and go back with me really, really quickly to Genesis chapter 6. There's something here that we kind of skipped over because I didn't really have time to cover this, but I feel like it bears repeating because it's, uh, there's a lot of people teaching on this. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says this, When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Now, you've probably heard this and read this before. Some people have speculated based on different interpretations and different things that, are, uh, that show up in the Old Testament that the sons of God were actually fallen angels and that they went and they intermarried with human women and created these massive things. Okay, a lot of people teach that. Um, and a lot of people believe that. And it sounds kind of an interesting thing. I don't personally think that that is what happened. And the main reason I don't think that is because angels are spiritual beings. They don't have physical bodies. Okay, God actually talks about the angels. He's, you know, when he answered the question about whose wife will this one be, he's like, you don't understand. They'll be like the angels when you get to heaven. They're not given in marriage, Okay. Angels can manifest themselves as different things, but the reason they can do that is because they don't have a physical body. They're not trapped in a physical body. I can put on a costume and try to look like something else, but I can't actually manifest myself as something else because I'm trapped in this physical body. So I do not particularly hold to the idea that somehow fallen angels procreated with God's children, and then we had this race of humans that had to be destroyed. I just, I don't see that. 
what I think God is telling us is that the Canaanite line, okay, those were the, the men of the earth. The sons of God were the Sethites, the Seth line, because they were the godly people. And if you look at the line of Noah, Noah's people came from Seth, and only righteous people you find are from Seth's line. And you look at Cain's line, and like they just turned into murderers and so on and so forth. So you seem to have, right before the flood, almost like two different groups of humanity. You've got these few this remnant of godly people. And remember, God always has a remnant. And then you have all of these Canaanite descendants who just seem to be pretty disgusting people. That's the way I see it. But I had to discuss that because I know it's going to come up if you do a lot of Bible study or whatever, or if you're like me and you like to read and study these things. So continue with me, if you would, in Hebrews chapter 1. And that is Christ the Son. Now let's look at Christ the King. Look with me at verse 8. But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. What a treasure. I have to share this with you. I have been uh, recently reading... Um, a new book about the coming third temple. And it's kind of interesting. If you know, underneath the temple mount there in Jerusalem, there are caves and caverns and underground structures that go all the way back to the time of Solomon. And if you think about it, when they had um, large uh, events and they had lots of sacrificed animals, they had to keep these somewhere and they didn't parade them around in the courts. They did all this underground. Solomon had stables and barns and all these things carved out underground. And to this day, there are so many unknown caverns and it's difficult to apparently to get permission to go into them and to study them or whatever. But one of the things that they have found is a little vial of anointing oil. And you say, what difference does that make? I I thought about it when I read this, when it says that Jesus has been anointed with the oil. Okay. One of the things in preparation for the third temple, and they're ready to build that thing because they believe it's time for Messiah to show up. Okay. We know he's already been here, but they think it's time for him to show up. And so they want to be able to build this temple and furnish it with all the necessary things. And one of the things they have to have is the proper anointing oil. This is the oil that they anointed kings with, and this is the oil that they anointed the the temple furnishings with to make sure they were purified. And they found this little clay vessel with some gelatinous oil, and they reconstituted it, and they tested it because they thought maybe it was the very last of that oil all the way back from the time of probably Samuel and it had been buried underground and they tested it and it was exactly what the Bible said that oil had to be and I can't tell you because I'm not there but from what I have read and understand there was a tremendous amount of joy knowing we can build the third temple We can properly anoint all of the furnishings. And guess what? This almost makes me cry. I I, I understand my Jewish brothers, they don't know that Jesus has already come. They're waiting, okay? But do you understand how excited they were to know when Messiah comes, we have the oil to anoint him with? I believe when Jesus does come back and he sets up his thousand-year reign of Christ where he actually rules the earth for a thousand years and I believe that's probably the oil they will use and they will anoint they'll know he was who he is okay their eyes are going to be opened but can you imagine Jesus being anointed with this oil that's been dug up out of the ground that's been in there for hundreds and hundreds of years you think God saved it for that purpose I just I don't know things like that just send chills down my spine maybe I've watched too much Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark but That just sends chills down my spine when I think God knows. 
He knows. He knows Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to be anointed. And he's not going to be anointed with some generic oil. He's going to be anointed with the proper oil that came from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. I just had to throw that in there because Christ is the king. And lastly, Christ the creator. Look at verse 10. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? The Bible also speaks of the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold being various and complicated wisdom of God. And the Bible talks about this manifold wisdom of God being displayed through his church, through the church age. And as I said this morning in Life Group, Jesus in Matthew 24 was explaining to us all of the things that are going to happen when he comes back and wraps up human history. Okay, But in between his first coming and his second coming, the church age, that's why we talked this morning about the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is that power force through that entire church age. And it's an exciting thing to be studying, but it's also interesting to, to understand that the Bible teaches that even the angels are watching what God is doing. Do you understand? They watch. We're on display. It's not just other people that are watching what God does in the world. The angels, they're watching. They're seeing the wisdom of God unfold. They're seeing this plan unfold. They're watching it. Don't you know that's probably why they sing and praise God so much? If we could see it that clearly, we'd probably never have an ungrateful day in our lives. Do you understand that? If we could see it that if we could see God's plan that clearly. That's why I don't think heaven is full of people who are blind and can't see what's going on. I don't think they're watching us, okay? I don't think my mother's looking down and watching me and knows what I ate for lunch and stuff like that. I don't, I don't feel that. I don't think that. But I also don't think that when you get to heaven that God like erases your memory and you, have no, you don't know anything. I think you just understand everything that's happening down here so much more clearly that you can say, oh, praise God, you've got the, you really have this under control. Oh, 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 Lord, yes, you really do have a plan, and it really is unfolding, and wow, I really can see the end point. And I think that's why in, in heaven, there's nothing for us to be sad about anymore. If we could see it with heavenly eyes, the way the angels do, we, we wouldn't be sad. We wouldn't get upset about things that don't matter. We'd be excited all the time. Um, if you would... I want you to pray with me, and I'm going to ask if you would stand. And We're going to do a little bit different tonight, but me and Miss Jane are just going to play a little bit of Just As I Am. And if you want to come and pray at the altar, the altar is open. If you want to come and talk to me, just come pull me away from the piano. But I'd like for you to just stand and pray with me for just a moment. Our Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is such a glorious, glorious God. Savior, sustainer, creator. Wow, I mean, there just aren't words enough, Lord, to describe what has been given to us. And so, Father, we just want to say thank you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are so good that you accept us as we are. And so, Father, we just come before you tonight to just uh, take a moment to just reflect and to just speak. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, convict us, call us to prayer, show us what you want us to do and how you want us to do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just as I have with 
missed.